black people. There is a movement going on, folks. I hate to tell you. People have not seen anything like this. And, you know, I'd like to think it's me, but I think it's the message. It really is a message. It's so important. And I say it all the time. We don't have victories anymore. We're going to have so many victories. Oh, you're going to get so tired of victories. In fact, it, uh, we never get tired of victory, right? In fact, you know, uh, you probably saw Saturday Night Live. Did anybody watch? So they set a tremendous ratings. I mean, the ratings were like through the roof. You heard, right? Oh, the media was so disappointed in those ratings. They were dying to say Trump bombs, the show was a disaster, nobody watched, but it was even the pickets, they all left a half hour earlier, they went home to watch the show. It's true. You know, if you watch, and, and I'll tell you what, I love the Hispanics, my relationship is so great. We're going to win with the Hispanics, we're going to win. But, but, you know, know I, I watched, watched the news before Saturday Night Live went on. And it was incredible, really, an incredible experience. And the whole thing, there was an electricity. You people all feel it. I have the same electricity tonight. This is incredible. But, but I turned on all of the major newscasts. They have this beautiful Lorne Michaels, great guy. He has a television set up. I'm sitting there watching television, right? And I'm getting ready to go on. And all day long, they're broadcasting Tremendous galleries of people are there protesting Trump being on Saturday Night Live. It's unbelievable. It's incredible. So I sent one of my guys out there. How bad is it? I said to him, he's right here, Keith. I said, Keith, how bad is it? He said, Mr. Trump, there's hardly anybody there. There's like 27 people. It's true. And all day long, I'm hearing. And you know, you could tell because they didn't use the wide-angle lens. You understand? It was focused like at four people in the middle. It's true. And I could tell. I said, you know, I think they're really misrepresenting. The media really does misrepresent that, I can tell you. So we sent them out, and, and it was a small group. But the funniest thing was they did leave early, and I hope they enjoyed the show. I'm sure they did. And then they said $5,000 to anybody that says certain negative things about Trump. And who did it? Our man. That was pretty cool, right? Hard to believe I wrote that script, but I thought it was pretty cool. So we had a great time, and they saw Hillary tonight. Anybody ever hear of Hillary? Hillary. Hillary. And you'll be happy to hear that head to head, I beat Hillary very easily. Isn't that nice? Very nice. Well, we have to. We have no choice. So, Hillary, they said, you know, when you did Saturday Night Live four weeks ago, that was the opening show. That traditionally would be their big show. And she had Miley Cyrus, who I think is terrific. And I had Sia, but Sia's not, I, I'd love Sia, but, you know, I would say that Miley would have an advantage, would you think, you know, with ratings? So, Hillary had Miley Cyrus, supposed to be, you know, the biggest star other than Trump. And, kidding. No, no, my wife feels that, though. She said, you do not realize you are the biggest star anywhere in the world. You do not realize this. You do not realize. And I said, really? Do you mean it? You are bigger than anybody. You are bigger than Tom Cruise. You are bigger than anybody. And a friend of mine said, now I know she's really smart, right? By saying that. Because I'm happy. But it was very interesting because uh, we were talking about Hillary today, and somebody said her performance wasn't that good because she was mispronouncing words, especially when, you know, she mispronounced a couple of words and stuttered a couple of times. And all she had was one little skit. I had the whole evening, and I didn't stutter once, right? I didn't stutter once. And I got really good reviews. Except from a couple of people that gave me the review before they saw it. You know, there were some, they wrote up the review before they even saw me. One published it slightly before I went on. That's how I know that was a fact. 
But we got great reviews, we got great ratings, it was a lot of fun, and I think it made a point, and it was sort of cute. I think one of the popular skits, well, they like the dancing, right? But, but one of the popular skits was when the President of Mexico, Mr. Trump, Enrique, Enrique, and he comes in, I have a check for you. And I said, Enrique, it was for $20 billion, right? Now, I can do it for seven. So I said, no, no, no. This is too much, Enrique. I don't need to owe Mr. Trump. No, we need this. Now, what did he say? He said, walls build friendship. Now, that was sort of a little fun. But you know what? Walls will keep friendship because we won't be ripped off so much once we build that wall. And that wall is going to get built. It's going to get built. And I love Mexico. I love the Mexican people. I have thousands of Hispanics that work for me, tens of thousands over the years. They're great people. But I will tell you this. Thank you, Fox. Thank you. <laughs> but I will tell you, and you know, the politicians that we're running against, they don't have a clue. Thank you. But you know, what's going to happen is Mexico is going to pay for the wall. I will tell you right now, they're going to pay for the wall. Because they've been doing a number on us. Their leaders are much smarter, much more cunning than our leaders. Our leaders don't have a clue. They do not have a clue. And they're really far more cunning. Get out of here. You know what that was? I thought they were yelling in favor of Trump. Then finally I realized, not working so well, it said, feel the burn. That means Bernie. That means Bernie. All right? Now, now think of this. Think of this. First of all, a couple of young women took over the microphone from Bernie a month ago, right? They took it over and he was like this, huh? He is not stopping ISIS, I will tell you. And Hillary is not stopping ISIS, I can tell you that. Hillary is not strong enough She's not tough enough. She's no way she's going to be able to do it. And there's always problems with Hillary. You know, it's always a problem. It's always a problem. But they're not going to be able to do the job, and that I can tell you. And Bernie had his chance during the debate. And he said, the emails, oh, forget about the emails. Now he's trying to take it back. And look, if we had honest government, Hillary wouldn't be allowed to run in this case. He wouldn't be allowed to run. You know that. People are in jail right now for doing 5% of what she did, and the Democrats are not going to prosecute her, and it's frankly a disgrace. And you know it, and so do I, and so do these people right here. They know it. And you better remember, there's a six-year statute of limitations on that crime. So Hillary's running for a lot of reasons. One of them is because she wants to stay out of jail. Because I am sure, and first of all, everybody gets a fair shake with me, but I am sure whoever the Attorney General is, you know, you got a lot of years left on that crime. That's a crime. General Petraeus got two years probation, and he was somebody that everybody liked, everybody respected. What she did is so much worse, and I will tell you that if I win, we're going to look into that crime very, very seriously, folks. Very, very serious. It's a real problem.
And now she's saying to herself, she's watching right now, and she's saying to herself, man, I better win. So we have to make our country great again. We have to do it. We're going to make it so good, and we're going to make it so strong, and we're going to take back trade from China, and we're going to take back trade from Japan and from India, and from all of the countries, all of whom I respect, almost all of whom I have a very good relationship with, and I've done deals. But we're going to take back our country. We're going to take back our jobs. We're going to take back our manufacturing. And we are going to bring it back. We have right now close to 100 million people. You talk about labor participation. The worst has been in 36 years. We have a phony number when you hear 5.2%, 5.3%. If it was 5.2%, this room would be empty, practically. Other than, we don't like what's happening with ISIS. We don't like what's happening with everything. But if it was 5.2%, I will tell you right now, this room would be half empty instead of having set a new record and having beaten my friend Elton John. Can you imagine that? Well, it may have been Elton, but I will tell you, one of the biggest said, you get the biggest crowds of any human being on Earth, Donald, for somebody without a guitar. You know what that means. In other words, for a non-musician. So, we're going to bring it back. You know, you have a case that I've been talking to, not so far away, a very nice place called Chicago. Do we love Chicago? Yes? Right. Right? right? Yeah. Okay, love it or not, it's ours, right? Right. It's not another country. So Nabisco is moving, as you know, their big plant. They're going to move it to Chicago. Right now, it was just announced. They're moving it into out of Chicago, and they're moving it into Mexico. You believe it? You believe it? And I tell people, I am never eating an Oreo. Tonight in the plane, they had Oreos. They may be the last made in this country, but I wouldn't eat them anyway, because the, the threat is there. So they're moving Nabisco out. They're moving Ford to Mexico. Boeing is building a big plant in China. All over the world, we're building plants. All over the world, we're losing. And all over the world, we build plants. In China, think of this. We have a trade imbalance of almost $400 billion a year. Can you imagine? Can you imagine if we could straighten it out? Could you imagine if I could get that down to, and I promise I'll do better than this, but could you imagine if I could get it down to 100 billion a year in losses? In losses, where we saved 300 billion. Now, let's say we break even because we want to be nice, but we have rebuilt China. We have totally rebuilt. You go to China, they have bridges like the George Washington Bridge, like many, many bridges all over the place, going up, left, right, all over. What do we build here? What do we build? What do we build? We build nothing. And I said it. China, what they've done to us, is the greatest theft in the history of the world. It's true. They've taken our jobs. They've taken our money. They've taken our base. They've taken our spirit. People graduate now from college. One of the biggest questions I get when I go around are students. They go to college. They do well. They borrow money up to here. They get through, and they can't get a job. And now they owe money. And this, the country wants to go after them. The country wants to go after these kids. And what has the country done? They've given jobs out to everybody else. Today I read, and I have Starbucks, they're my tenants. Did you read about Starbucks? No more Merry Christmas on Starbucks, no more. I wouldn't buy, hey look, I'm speaking against myself. I have one of the most successful Starbucks in Trump Tower. Maybe we should boycott Starbucks, I don't know, seriously.
I don't care. By the way, that's the end of that lease, but who cares? Who cares? Who cares? But today, a big story that Starbucks is taking Merry Christmas off. No more Merry Christmas. I will tell you, lots of big things, lots of little things. You can call this anything you want. But if I become president, we're all going to be saying Merry Christmas again. That I can tell you. That I can tell you. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. Now, you know, some of the candidates running, including Hillary, the other day, I mean, can you imagine Hillary being pre Can you imagine? You know, she's a little different person. She got a little burst of energy because she figures she's not going to be indicted. She got through the Benghazi hearings, what that was all about. I don't know why they didn't go after her, but she got through those hearings. I blame the Republicans for that, to be honest with you. It's ridiculous. And now she's got a burst of energy, but it won't last long, believe me. It won't last long because the energy is not a natural energy, and it's not going to last long, and you can't have it. So, the Zogby poll just came out, very highly respected Zogby poll. Ten minutes ago, just before I came on, I said, good, I can mention a new poll. And it was Trump leading 30, Carson 17, despite all this stuff going around about it. And everybody else much lower than that. That's good. That's good. Just happened. Zogby. Zogby, one of the good ones. So Hillary mentioned recently, and so did Jeb Bush. But I don't mention him anymore because he's just not working out. You know, I'll tell you a little secret. So we had him in a really rough line. And we had him in a rough line on Saturday Night Live. The butt of the joke was Jeb. And because I'm so nice, I said, you can't do it. It's too mean. Too nasty. Too nasty. See? How nice am I? It would have been the best crack of the evening. Would have been the best joke, and I said, take it out. But Hillary said, she said, good for you. Nice, right? See? Right. I didn't want to do it. In fact, actually, we tried it out, and everybody said, oh, just leave the guy alone. We said, let's take it out. But he's, he's not doing too well. He's not doing too well. And he, he's been defined. Now I have to define a couple of other people. And it should be easier, actually. I mean, it should be easier. With, with what's going on with this election, I've never seen anything like it. People are getting away with murder. I've never saw anything like this. You can say anything about anybody, and their poll numbers go up. No matter what you do. If you try and hit your mother over the head with a hammer, your poll numbers go up. I never saw anything like it. Now, I haven't seen that yet, but, you know, probably that's going to happen. No, it's a weird, a lot of weird things are happening. This is a strange election, isn't it? Man. You stab somebody, and the newspapers say, you didn't do it. And you said, yes, I did, I did it. No, you didn't. Yes, I did. I stabbed him, and it hit the belt. And they said, you didn't do it. If they said I didn't do it, I'd be so happy. <laughs> this is the only election in history where you're better off if you stab somebody. What are we coming to? And other things. And other things. A lot of crazy things are happening out there. But Hillary said, I don't like Donald Trump's tone. He didn't like my tone. You know, I built a great company, and I actually have a great temperament for success. I have a great temperament, I will tell you. And I don't like being ripped off like we're being ripped off. I wouldn't sleep. You know, I'm not a big sleeper. Like three hours, four hours, I toss and turn, I think, I beep, beep, beep. I want to find out what's going on. And you know, I'm the only one. I'm self-funding my campaign. I'm putting up my own money, right? right? Except for the little donations where they send in $50 and $17 and $28 and even a few hundred dollars.
But I'm funding because how do you send back? A woman sends a check for $17, send it back. You can't. And also, that's really an investment in the country. It's an investment in a campaign. There's no influence peddling. I can't be bought for $17. But we have amazing people. But, and that doesn't amount to, relatively speaking, doesn't amount. But I'm the only one that's self-funding my campaign. I'll put up a lot of money. In fact, we just started with radio ads. Did anybody hear the ads yet? They're good, yeah. I figured, why should we go fancy? Let me just talk. We got a mic. I spoke. We will do this. We will do that. We will defeat ISIS. We will build our military strong. We will take care of our vets. Right. I don't believe in Common Core. I want local education. Right? Right? I believe in the Second Amendment. I want to be able to protect myself. I want to protect myself. I want to repeal and replace Obamacare. I didn't say this in the ad, but a couple of extra things. I mean, I want to have a country, and it sounds a little strange at first, but when we talk about it, I want to have leaders that are unpredictable. I don't want leaders saying, we are sending 50 men to Iraq. We are sending 50 men to Syria. Why don't we just send them? Send them. Send them. Now they're being bountied. They're being hunted like dogs are being hunted. Because we have a president that wants to show how tough he is by sending 50 men. So everybody over there, they're not babies. You know, they're not the JV that this guy thought they were, okay? Remember the JV? They're the JV. Well, they just knocked down an airline. They only say it's 99.9% .9 as of today. This is not the JV. But why would we say at a microphone, we just sent 50 men to Syria. He's what? When we had Iraq, and I was against going into Iraq, and I was against it since a long time, and I was right, and the White House sent people because I was, I guess I get a disproportionate amount of publicity. I made a statement. It was in Reuters, like in 2004. It was in one of the big magazines in 2003. Don't go into Iraq, you're going to destabilize the Middle East, and Iran is going to come in and take over Iraq. Iraq has these incredible oil reserves, number two in the world. Don't do it, and you'll have other bad things happen. ISIS, you'll have other bad things come out. Don't do it. And I am, by the way, the most militaristic person in this room, and you have some serious, believe me, believe me. You know, one of the things I tell people, I will build our military so strong and so powerful that nobody's going to mess with us. We're not going to have to use it. We're not going to have to use it. When General Ordiano left a couple of weeks ago, I saw him on television. All these guys are on television. I don't want my generals on television. I don't want them on television. The word unpredictable, I want to be unpredictable. But when General Ordiano left, he said something that, frankly, he shouldn't have said, but he said it. He was being interviewed. He's leaving. And he said, our military right now is the least prepared of any time. And I think he said since the beginning. But he could have said since the Second World War, either one of which, can you imagine? Now, if I'm Putin, if I'm China, if I'm this wise guy from North Korea that nobody even talks about, you know, it's interesting. He has nuclear weapons. We go after Iran with one of the dumbest deals in history, right? One of the dumbest. No, one of the dumbest. But they don't talk about the guy in North Korea who actually has nuclear weapons. We've got 20 out, 28,000 soldiers sitting there on the line between this maniac and South Korea. And I say, South Korea. I order my televisions from South Korea. Unfortunately, we don't make them here, right? You have no choice. Doesn't make me a bad person. I order thousands and thousands of televisions from South Korea for hotels, for all the things I do. 
They give us like, relatively, they give us nothing. We protect them. We protect, you know, Saudi Arabia before the, the oil went down. Now it's gone down. But before it went down, they were making $1 billion a day. So let's assume now they make a lot. More money than this country will ever be thinking of. Why do we protect? I'm all for Saudi Arabia. Now, I didn't like that when the World Trade Center came down, the scum that knocked it down sent their families all back to Saudi Arabia, and then we attack Iraq. I wasn't exactly thrilled with that. But why is it, why is it that we protect Saudi Arabia? We get nothing. We get nothing. Why is it that we protect Japan? Now, Japan is an economic behemoth. They send cars by the millions. If Japan is attacked, we have to defend them to the end. This is the kind of agreements we make. If we're attacked, Japan doesn't have to help us at all. Right? So we protect Germany. I had no idea. Don't forget, I only became a politician four months ago. But I'm a, I'm a very, very fast learner. I'm like the world's fast. I am really a fast learner. We protect Germany. We're protecting. When you talk about an economic monster, take a look at what they sell. Take a look at what they make. And by the way, why she took all of these folks from Syria, this could be one of the great Trojan horses of all time. And you know, in Germany right now, the German people are rioting. The crime is unbelievable. They never had a problem. The German people, Merkel, I always thought she was a hell of a leader. And then about a month ago, I said, is she crazy? And in this country, our president wants to take in 250,000 new people. And I have a heart, I have a heart, believe me, bigger than his heart. But when I look at the migration and the migrant, they look at that big, they call it the big migration. And you too, right? I see all these strong guys. They're all young. And I say, why aren't they fighting for their country? Why are they migrating? And I say, that's a weird thing, right? I see all of these people, and they're young. And I don't see a lot of women. I don't see a lot of children. I see these young, strong men. And I'm saying, what's going on? That's a strange deal. That's a strange deal. So when I was asked about two months ago, what do you think about it? Would you take in 3,000? Now, at that time, 3,000. All right. I said, I guess. So do we always have to do it? Do we always have to be the suckers? I guess. Well, what about 5,000? Oh, I guess. Then all of a sudden, a week later, I've been hearing 25,000, 50,000. Now I'm hearing the number is 200 and 50,000 people. These are people that don't have documents, that don't have paper. We have no idea where they come from. They may be ISIS, and they probably aren't. You know the old story of the Trojan horse. Could be the ultimate. This could be the great Trojan horse of all time. So it's going to cost us, over a 10-year period, billions of dollars. I saw a report. I couldn't believe it. Billions and billions of dollars. They've got to learn our language. We've got to set up schools. Are we crazy? And by the way, the Gulf states, some of the wealthiest countries in the world, they will take none. None. They won't put up money. They won't take them. And here we are. We owe $19 trillion. And we're going to take in 250,000 people. It's so sad. I mean, it's so sad. And then I look at a guy like Rubio, who's very, very weak on illegal immigration. He was a member of the Gang of Eight. That meant come in. You know what the Gang of Eight was? Come in. Come in. Come on in. He was a member of the Gang of Eight. Very weak. And by the way, so was Carson. Carson wants to come in, and he wants to let the people come in. You can't do it. You can't do it, folks. We can't take it. Our system can't take it. These are people with no experience. These are people that never met a payroll. These are people that have never done it before. 
and they don't know what they're doing. They don't, I don't care, they'll do well, they get a nice smile, they look good. Everyone tells me Rubio's a wonderful speaker. I said, really? Tell me why. Tell me why. He's a wonderful speaker. He's actually a nice guy. I don't care if he's a nice guy. Honestly, I don't care if he's a nice guy. Remember when he was doing the message to the president? Remember the thing with the water? This guy gets the greatest press. So he's, you know, sweating and sweating, pouring sweat. Now, the president had just spoken, right? And he's doing the message. This is a big thing. They selected him, I think, because he was young. So they selected him. And he's talking. I notice. I say, man, is he sweating. And then all of a sudden, and we will fight, and we will this. And it wasn't out of a glass. It was out of a bottle. I don't know. Maybe he got paid for the company that had the bottle. I don't know. It's the weirdest thing. And then they said, oh, he did such a great job. I said, oh, he did? Some people are lucky, or something's going on. Or something's going on. Explain it to me. Now, the last debate, people said Rubio did. Now, in all fairness, every single poll I won that I did the best, OK? I don't know. I don't know. I think I did well. NBC, CNBC said I won in their poll. CNBC. If CNBC, after the disgraceful job they did, said I won. But you had Drudge, who's great. You had Time Magazine. I certainly don't have any influence over them. And you had many of them. And you had NBC said I came in third. I was very unhappy with that. But it's sort of interesting, because I watched Bush and Rubio going at it. And I heard Bush just got and Honestly, I did other than he quit at the end, right? You can't quit. He gave a decent statement about Rubio, that he never shows up to vote. You know, he is elected a senator. You're supposed to like, well, I like it, I don't like it. But Bush gave a decent little preamble. Rubio responded, no great shakes. Was it like earth shattering? And then Bush didn't say anything. And that was the problem. That won't happen with me. Believe me, that won't happen. That won't happen. Because Bush just got absolutely slaughtered the next day. And I think it was his lack of response. And you can't have that. You know, you can't. That's why you need high energy, not low energy, right? We need high energy. So we have people that I'm running against. And honestly, I have to say what I have to say. You know, I have to be honest. I'm a straight shooter. And I think to a certain extent, that's why I'm doing well. And to a certain extent, that's why I draw more hostility than anybody else. Because I don't care. I don't care. The country's so bad now, it's doing so poorly on so many different fronts, that whatever it is, it is. They would like me to be more politically correct. I went to an Ivy League school. I'm like an intelligent person. I can be so correct that even the correct people would have said, man, he is the most elegant human being I've ever seen. <laughs> but we don't have time. We don't have time. Like Anchor Babies, you remember the reporter? He said, you know, Anchor Baby is a very derogatory term at a news conference. I said, well, what would you suggest I say? He said, the child of an undocumented immigrant who happened to be born on the wrong side of the I said, no, thank you. <laughs> and you know, the f it's true. Remember that deal? The reporter. Someday I'll tell you what his name was. But we can't have people coming over. We're talking about hundreds of thousands of people a year, and from all over the world. From all over the world they come. And they get born. They're born here. And now for the next 85 years, we're all taking care of everybody. And you know, if you have, this is true, if in Mexico, as an example, and this doesn't just happen with Mexico, but if you have a baby in Mexico, they'll give you a few days to recover and you're the hell out of there with the baby. If you want to become a citizen of Mexico, it's one of the hardest countries in the world to become a citizen of, one of the hardest. I couldn't do it, although maybe I'm very good at that stuff, but maybe. But you know, you go to Mexico, and you're there for a week, and you have a pass for a week. They come up and see you at the end of a week. Are you prepared to leave, sir? A friend of mine was in Mexico. 
Nice guy, nice family. They came to him a day before. The police, are you leaving tomorrow, sir? Uh, well, I need some, well, you'll have to apply. Hey, by the way, I'm not saying that's wrong. That's the right way of doing things. That's the right way of doing things. With us, people come in, they stay for the rest of their lives. We're stupid. We have stupid people leading us. We have incompetent people. No, no, we have incompetent people leading us. And we can't keep doing it. We can't keep doing it. You're at 19 trillion, but you heard the report today with unfunded liabilities and all the other problems, you could be at over 60 trillion dollars. I don't even want to say it. But you could be at 60 trillion dollars. They're talking about all the unfunded liabilities. So we have got to get this election right. We can't go with these politicians. All talk, no action, don't know what they're doing, don't give a damn about anything but being reelected. That's all they care about. That's all they care about. And some of them are nice. I mean, they're nice people. Ben Carson said the other day that as far as Medicare is concerned, now Medicare works. There's waste, there's fraud, there's abuse. We can take care of it, largely. But Medicare works, and he wants to abolish Medicare. How can, you, how can you possibly be popular if you want to abolish Medicare? It actually works. Would anybody mind losing Medicare in this audience? Huh? Right? You can't do it. You can't do it. Too many things involved. And the things that do work, we want to, we want to hold on to it. So what happens is, in the next election, I believe it's going to be the most important election, certainly within the last hundred years, that this country has ever had. I really believe it. And we have so many things to do, and we're going to do them. And we're going to do them right. We're going to straighten out the country. We're going to run it, and I don't even want to say as a business, because we have to have heart. We have to have heart. But we're going to run our country properly, and we're going to be proud of our country. And we're not going to let China take all of our jobs and business. We're not going to let them. We're not going to let them. <clears throat> we're not going to have websites that cost $5 billion, like Obamacare. Everybody forget about it. You forgot about it. We're not going to have a website that costs $5 billion and to this day doesn't work. And we're not going to have a plan where our president lied to us 28 different times by saying you can keep your doctor, you can keep everything, you can have whatever you want just to prove it. And he makes it right on the button because Democrats that voted for Obamacare would have never done it, except he lied. And then the Republicans did nothing about the lie. I'm, I'm almost, and I have to say this, I'm a Republican, I'm a conservative guy, but I'm a Republican. I'm almost more disappointed in the Republicans than I am in the Democrats. Because the Republicans say we're going to go and fix, and we're going to this, and then I tell the story, and I've seen them. I've supported them. I, su I support so many people. So I don't even know who the hell they are. Bing, bang, checks. Who's he? Where's he from? He's a Republican. Okay, good luck. They go down. They go down to Washington. And something happens to them. You've heard me say it before, right? They're really, we're going to stop Obamacare. We're going to this, we're going to that, we're going to be great. And then they walk into that gorgeous, the Capitol. And they see that beautiful ceiling, the vaulted ceiling, that now has scaffolding all over it, but these are minor details. But they see these beautiful halls and these beautiful columns, and they're with their wife. Look, darling, we finally made it. We finally made it. And now it's time to come up with a tough vote on many things, on budget. Did you see the budget? It was passed like in two seconds. The budget. And they go, yes. 
Oh, yes, yes. I, please don't ever take me away from these hallowed halls. Something happens to these people. I promise you it will not happen to me. I promise. Just a couple of things. I have — I talk about this Iran deal only because, to me, it's maybe the worst contract. Forget about deals between countries or whatever. It could be the worst contract I've ever seen drawn. I've seen some bad ones. I buy bad contracts. I love bad contracts. You buy them, you can buy them cheap, and then you work them out. Throw them into a chapter. You do a lot of things. I get — I, oh, well, Mr. Trump, is it true that you filed bankruptcy? I said, no, I bought a thing, and I threw it in, and I did a great number, and I did — I mean, look, I'm a businessman, right? I did a number in the banks. I did a number in everybody, and I have something good. I love bad contracts. Buying them is great. Now, in his case, I really wish that that was a good contract. But that contract is one of the most incompetent deals. We gave everything. We gave $150 billion to a terrorist nation. They don't need nuclear because they can buy it. They don't have to work on it. They have so much money now, they can buy it. We gave — and these are people that riot in the streets, burning the flag. Did you see yesterday burning flags all over — all over Iran? You know, at what point does the President say, wait a minute, this is too much? On television, they're burning our flag all over Iran. They're saying death to America, death to Israel, death to anybody. And we're giving them $150 billion. We're letting them — how about this one? Self-police. They are going to tell us whether or not they're building nuclear weapons. Now, think of it. They're going to tell us, I promise we are not building — can you believe this? This is Kerry. He may be the worst negotiator. In fact, I've said Hillary Clinton is the worst secretary of state in history. Okay? I have bad news for you. Because of the deal that Kerry made with Iran, he may be worse. He may be worse. Hate to say it. So they have the 24-day period. But think about this. We have four hostages over there. They're hostages. They're holding four. When it started years ago — did you ever see a negotiation take so long? When it started years and years ago, this negotiation, when it started, what happened? Why didn't we say, we want our hostages back, and if you don't give them back, we're doubling and tripling the sanctions? They would have been back to the table that evening, and we would have had these people here. I met one of their wives, who's a phenomenal woman. Her husband's in jail because he's a Christian. You believe this? And he's over there. And these jails are serious jails. These are the meanest places. They say it's one of the worst in the world. Can you imagine? So we've got four people over there. We're giving all of this money, all of this access, we, they will have nuclear weapons soon, and we don't even get them back. Now, today, and over the last short period, they say, we will now discuss the hostages. Why didn't we get them back? Why didn't we say, before we start, three years ago, before we start, we want our hostages back, and they will say no, and we will say bye-bye, see you, double up the sanctions. They'll call you. They'll call you. Within 24 hours, yes, you would give your hostages back. We are led by people that are so weak and so ineffective. They don't respect us. They don't respect us at all. Now, why wouldn't we have said, you give them? And I will tell you this. If I win, if I win, those hostages, I guarantee, will be back long before I take office, I tell you right now. But you know what's happening. Already now we're having — we just gave them $150 billion. Now we're having new negotiations, and they want 19 people. We won't give you all four back. We'll only give you three. We want 19 million. And as this guy who's far too smart for Kerry, the chief negotiator from Iran, said, we want 19 people. 
and we want many other things. Can you believe this? You know, I would like to throw something at the television. You just can't believe it. You can't believe it. So now we're negotiating to get our hostages back. And when they asked Kerry and the President, why didn't we get the hostages back? They said, we didn't want to complicate the negotiation. Okay? Didn't want to complicate. All you do is you start, and not at the end. You start, say, we want it. We did the art of the deal. They didn't read the art of the deal. Do you agree? They didn't read the art of the deal. But why would you start by saying we want it back? Now, the reason I bring that up is it just shows how foolish we are. Whether it's that or I always say Sergeant Bergdahl. That's military. But we get a dirty, rotten traitor who I'd like to dump right back where we got him. You know, he left. He left. Six people got killed looking for him, right? He left because he said, oh, when I looked at his father, I said, whoa, whoa, what have we here? Right? I said, whoa, what's this all about? So he left, and he thought, oh, this is going to be wonderful. He's going to, well, they knocked the hell out of him. He didn't have a good time. I don't think he'll be going there anytime soon, right? But here's the amazing thing. In the old days, when we were strong and wise, we shoot a guy like that. A traitor. He's a traitor. No, no, we shoot him. I don't care. In the old days, when we were strong and wise, traitors were treated very, very harshly. If you look at what happened last week, they feel that he wasn't really 100 percent feeling well. Perhaps he should get no jail time whatsoever. Do you believe this? This is what, okay. So here's the way we, I call Obama the five-for-one president. We get Bergdahl, they get five of their best, toughest, meanest killers that they've been trying to get out of there for nine years, right? And that's the way we negotiate. That's the way we negotiate. When China, just ordered 300 jets. We, you know, I don't know if you know with Boeing, right? China just ordered 300 planes. Boeing is now insisting, and you know, one of those things, they came to us, they now have to build a plant, a big, beautiful, nice new airplane manufacturing plant in China. Why? Why? We can't make the plane in South Carolina? Yes, we can. We can't make the plane the planes in Seattle, yes, we can. They make their product in China, and they send it to us. So Boeing now has to give up their trade secrets. Not that it matters, because China steals them anyway. But Boeing has to give up their trade secrets. And Boeing is going to build this incredible, massive plant in China so that China doesn't have to go through us anymore. And I'll tell you what will happen. Eventually, Boeing loses because China will end up taking the plan, say, thank you very much, you dumb suckers. That's what's going to happen. And we can't let this continue to go on. We can't let it continue to go on. Now, somebody said from the Wall Street Journal today, they said, well, you're wrong about trade. I believe in free trade. They said, I'm wrong. Give me a break. Big article, big thing. Trump's wrong about trade. They're talking about NAFTA. That's been a real good one for us, right? People bought, built factories all over Mexico. We lose factories all over the United States, and I'm hearing how I'm wrong. How is that? Let me ask you. How is that good for us? We close the factory in New England. It moves down to Mexico. They do the jobs. They build, they build this factory. They employ them. The Mexicans get employed. Other people get employed. Other countries. Get employed. How is it good for us? How is it good when we lose a factory, they build it in Mexico, they hire the people of their country, which of course they should, and they sell the product to us with no tax? Why is that good? You know, I'm like really smart. I'm trying to figure for a long time why? Why is it good? It's not going to happen anymore, folks. Not going to happen. Not going to happen anymore. A friend of mine is a manufacturer, and a really good one, and he sells to China. 
He tells me all about it. He knows better than any professor or any jerk I could hire or anybody in the government. They don't know what they're doing. Did you see the other day Carl Icahn, the great Carl Icahn, came out and endorsed Trump. I'll stop corporate inversion. I'll stop all these things that are happening. All these things. But my friend tries to go to China, and for years he's been dealing with China. He knows China better than anybody you could hire. He said it's impossible. He said, number one, they don't want your product. They make it impossible to take it in. And he makes better product than they do, by far. They'll find any reason. Oh, environmentally, we don't like. They'll find any reason not to have that product. So what happens, he goes to China, and he sees, he meets. And they negotiate a deal. They want a massive tax to be paid if he sells his product in China. We don't do that. So I'm a free trader. But we need smart trade. We can't let it be that we lose almost $400 billion. We want smart trade. How does it help us? And I tell this story. And I tell it again, because frankly, to me, it's a great story. I mean, to me, it's the ultimate. It's the Ford plant. I tell it all the time. In Mexico, they're building a $2.5 billion Ford plant, closing up plants all over the United States, mostly in Michigan. They're building a two and a half billion. You know what that is? Two and a half billion for a one-story building? It's going to go on forever. So they're going to hire all Mexican people, which is fine. And those people are going to get jobs, which is fine. People in Michigan, people from our country, out. Tennessee, the same thing, by the way. A big plant that was going to happen in Tennessee decided at the last moment they're going to move to Mexico. Mexico is becoming the car capital of the world, by the way. And I would tell. I would tell the head of Ford very strongly, and you got to understand, I said it at the beginning, I'm not taking political contributions. Nobody's giving me four, five, six million dollars. Somebody said the other day, these super PACs, by the way, are a scam. A scam. The super PACs are controlling every one of these guys. They're controlling these politicians. I will tell you, the super PAC that Carson has is running Iowa. You're not supposed to do that. The super PAC that Rubio has, the super PAC. Bush has $125 million in a super PAC. And these people are absolutely running. They're absolutely running the politicians. They have total and complete control over the politicians. And I say this, I say, so let me ask you this. I'm president. And I don't like it. And they call me, and they want to negotiate. Mr. President, and all the lobbyists, many of whom I know, I have no interest in helping them. I'm going to do what's right for you. But when a guy who just gave $5 million to Hillary or Jeb or Rubio or any of them, by the way, this guy Singer, they say he's a billionaire. Not as rich as I am, so that's <laughs> But he might be a nice guy. Heavy, heavy into weak immigration. Heavy. So you know that Rubio, where he's going right after the election. He's got to. The guy's given him a lot of money. They were all fighting over the guy. But tell me this. Tell me this. Who do you want negotiating for you? Thank you. Who do you want? Politicians cannot negotiate. I've made a fortune over my lifetime dealing with politicians. They can't negotiate because they don't care. They just want to keep people happy that help them. They don't care. And I tell the story. So let's say that I, I used to use Jeb Bush. Let's say I say, who should I use? Who do you want me to use? I, I can use any of them. I can use any of them. You want me to use Rubio? How about I'll use Hillary? How about Hillary? So they come up to see her, and she said, you know, she's not a dummy. And she'll come and she'll say, that's a bad deal. 
and they'll say, Madam President, you can't fight that because a special interest group gave you $5 million between your foundations and everything else, but they gave you $5 million and they want this plant to be built. You can't do it, Madam President. She said, well, it's such a bad deal. You can't do it. Then her lobbyist will come up. That's been a friend for years. That's been giving her millions and millions of dollars every time she runs. And they'll say, Hillary, you can't do this. These people have helped you out. And you know what's going to happen? Not 99%, 100%. She's going to say, OK, let the plant go forward. OK? She knows it's wrong. But it's, it's common sense. It's, it's human nature. Now, President Trump. President Trump! So, now President Trump, they come and they call him, and they say, Mr. Trump, we'd like to see you. This is the head of Ford. I said, what do you want? Are you the one that's building a plant in Mexico? Yes, sir, and I'd like to explain why it's a great idea. It's not a great idea. This, I'm like an intelligent. There's not a great idea. It's bad. You're closing in Michigan. You're closing other places. We're losing thousands and thousands of jobs. Then you're going to send your stuff. You're going to have it driven over by the illegals over the border. They'll drive it because you get them, right? You know it's going to drive the cars over the illegals because nobody checks them. Why not use them, right? So I'm going to say, why is it a good idea? After about a minute, I'll cut them off. Then I'll be called by friends of mine. Then I'll be called by special interests. Then I'll be called by lobbyists. But they didn't give me any money, and I didn't take any money. So I don't care. And I'll say to the president of Ford, I'm sorry, but unless you build in this country, our country, where we have jobs, where we want to have great people, unless you do that, we are going to charge you a 35% tax on every single car that you wheel over the border. Every single one. This plant makes cars, trucks, and parts. Everyone, 35%, and that's only because I'm being nice. So here's what's going to happen. They'll put a little pressure on me, believe me. Zero, zero chance. Within 24 hours, probably a lot sooner than that, I'll get a call from the head of Ford, or Nabisco, or Boeing, or whoever. It's all the same, all the same. They went to worse schools than I did, believe me. All the same. I will get a call from the head of Ford, Mr. President, we are going to build our plant in the United States. 100%. 100%. 100%. It's not even close. And I don't mean like, you know, maybe I think I can do it. Now, no other politician can do that for two reasons. Number one, they don't have the business up here. They don't have it. Number two, they're controlled by the lobbyists, special interests, and they're PACs. They're totally controlled. So. I will do such a good job. Here's the thing. The American dream, and I say it, the American dream is largely dead. It is, because between the regulations and the problems and all of the things, we will take regulations so far back, so many years back, and we'll keep some good ones. We'll bring regulations back. So far, you won't even believe it. But I say it all the time, the American dream is dead, but I'm going to make it bigger and better and stronger than ever before. I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it. We're going to make our country so strong and so rich and so powerful. We are going to take care of our people. Our people are going to come first. We're not going to allow incompetent politicians, stupid people, to be out negotiated every single time 
by other countries and other representatives. We're not going to have it anymore. Not going to happen. We are going to run our country so well and so tight and so smart. And you know what? All of these countries, India, Brazil, Japan, Mexico, everybody, they're going to respect us again. And they're going to like us better than they do now. They don't even like us. And we are going to make America great again. Believe me, I promise you. And I love you all. I love you all. Thank you. We will make America great again. Thank you.